All right, folks, there's the bell. Anybody not here is going to get a tardy slip. <laughs> uh, get sent home? <laughs> yeah. No such luck. They got to endure it along with the rest of us. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, pray for all these names on our prayer list. Still nobody I need to add to it, Wayne? Well, the only thing so far is the Pam and Jerry both to the weather. Oh, no. Okay. And he's supposed to have his procedure first. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, with that and other things in mind, let's go to our Father in prayer, if you would, with us, please. <laughs> Almighty God, we come before you now, grateful for this time together, Father that we have the blessing to be able to come together and study your word tonight. And I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit be present in us and among us to help make sense out of all this, Father, that it be spoken in your truth, your reality, and received in a beneficial manner to all who hear it, that we can all benefit by the blessing of your holy word. Father, we have many members among us who are not with us tonight, some who are, and we all have needs, Father, but some have requested that their names be brought before you in prayer, <clears throat> they can receive an extra measure of your perseverance, your comfort, your peace, your wisdom. So, Father, we want to pray now, asking sympathy in sympathy for Edwina Thompson and Edward Dismukes and the Holland family and the passing of Edwina's sister. We pray that Cliff and Edwina are able to get back safely, Father, and rest up and not suffer from this sudden tragedy and long journey that they had to endure. We pray for Yvonne Cooper and the family and the passing of her brother, Wayne Church. We pray for our brother, Kevin Watson, Father, and family at the passing of his mother, Shirley Watson. We have a, we pray for encouragement and growth in the mission work. It was good to hear of what is being done on your behalf, Father, by the contributions that this body has contributed to it. And we pray, Father, that it will continue to grow and benefit those in the world and here locally who need your redemption through Christ. Some who are recuperating from surgery or illnesses, Father, we want to bring up their names for you. Jonathan Sanford, as he recovers from COVID. Again, Father, please, please help him to finally be able to put all this behind him because he's been hit many times with it, Father. We pray for Myrna Bakshi and her healing, for Faith Carmichael and Kevin Carmichael, Gary Clark, Melba Doss, Lyndon Dutton, Christy Fox. We pray for Bonnie Green. We pray for Ellen and Jean Haas, Cookie Hawthorne and Leslie Hoffman, for Jackie Hunt, and Jerry Jones, Father, please help him in these complications that continue to slow down the procedure that he needs. We pray for Carol Lightfoot, for Rick and Vicki Ludwig. And again, Father, we pray that the bureaucratic establishments of men will be resolved so that they can get the transplant that is needed. We pray for Mary McFadden, Sally Mize, Shirley Norris, for Billy Preston. Pray that she gets over that pneumonia. We know that it has to be severe on her, Father. Not much to that lady. She's a little bitty. So. <laughs> we pray for Kat and Ryan, Ronnie, Reinhardt, and family. We give thanks that Jim Rogers has come home from the hospital, Father, and we pray that he continues to improve. Pray for Sandra Rowland, Doug Rutledge, Arabella Salvador, for Nancy Stover and family, that it be your will, Father, to heal her. For Jennifer Sanford, that it be your will to heal her also, Father, for the sake of their families. 
We pray for Carol Way, for Bob and Charlene York. We have homebound members and family and friends, Father, that we wish to lift up before you. We pray for Deborah Davis, who had surgery, and bless Yvonne Cooper, that even in the middle of her grief for the passing of her brother, that she is attending to the needs of Deborah Davis. Father, we pray for Jenna Lowry, 10 years old, God. Bless her father, who is giving up his body, literally, Father, that she can live. And we pray that she gets strong enough and well enough to be able to receive the donation of his kidney. And we praise you, God, that a donor was found. Pray for Samuel Moreno, that young seven-year-old who was injured so badly. And I pray, Father, that he never suffer any more abuse or fear or anxiety in this world, but only know the peace and the love of your embrace. Pray for Barbara Moser, Jerry Jones' sister. She had a stroke, Father. We pray that she recover from it and heal. We pray for Ruben Villarreal and family as they ask for faith and health and guidance and strength, the things that we all need, Father, an extra measure upon them. We pray for Julio Zuniga as he goes through a different, difficult time, Father, and he asks, for God to restore his faith and health. Please bless him and strengthen him, God, and let us be your light for him. Father, there are others whose names we do not have now, but we know that each and every one of us need you at all times, Father, for the grace of your mercy, for your love, your forbearance, your patience, God. And I ask the same now as we enter into this class, Father, that you be patient with us and that you guide us through the study of your holy word. In Jesus' holy, blessed, and beloved name I pray. Amen. Amen. All righty, brothers and sisters. Jonathan's got COVID. Cliff is, as I understand, just totally worn out. From the journey they had to make. So tonight, y'all get the night off from Romans, okay? Uh, unfortunately, you're going to have to listen to me. In Proverbs 16, verse 9, it's written, In his heart a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. So it was a week ago last Monday that I woke up with every intention of trying to prepare for a Sunday class that I have coming up this Sunday. On that Monday, I got a phone call from my own job, and I ended up losing most of last week working for them. So then I planned to get back on it, reboot on Friday, and then Saturday another hiccup came along. So I'm back on it on Monday. And then yesterday morning while walking the dog, I get a text message asking if I can fill in tonight. So that proves the adage that the best laid plans of mice and men oftentimes go awry. Okay. And it's hard a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. Mm -hmm. Well, I realized that uh, Jonathan said I could do a standalone lesson or go with Romans and man, I decided to stick clear of Romans. <laughs> But, uh, you know, only having 36 hours, Bible study, I don't do well under pressure. Some things I do, but Bible study is not one of them. I need time. But then I remembered that last fall I spoke on a Sunday night, a lesson on the right things for the wrong reason. And I had accumulated so much information, handwritten notes, that I started to throw the excess away, but just dropped them in a drawer. So while walking the dog, I was reminded, I've got notes. <laughs> so I can bear witness to the definite recognition that the providence of God is, is at work. 
that I held on to those notes. So tonight we're going to look at the right things for the wrong reasons, part two. And we're going to go to Acts chapter 8, verses 9 through 25. If you can go there with me, please. Acts chapter 8, verses 9 through 25. In the NIV, uh, there is a subtitle here, Simon the Sorcerer. You may have Simon the Magician, possibly Simon Magus. But uh, as I had mentioned last fall, that when I was last reading through this section of the Bible in my daily reading, it was the first time Simon kind of popped up in my mind there. You know, always before it has been about the works of Philip here and things. And I realized that uh, he was doing right things, but for the wrong reasons. <clears throat> so in Acts chapter 8, to put it in context somewhat, the church persecution had begun. And as it says here in 8 verse 5, Philip had fled to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. We know that Jesus, during his time on earth, had already gone to Samaria, to a town named Sikar, and we read about his interaction with the Samaritan woman at the well in John 4, verse 4, and verses following. We know the parable of the Good Samaritan. We know the lesson <coughs> Jesus speaking with the Samaritan woman at the well. And we know there's bad blood between Samaria and the Jews. And I'd often wondered about that. So again, in rereading the Bible, when I start over again, I was in First King chapter 16. And you can look at and the following chapter. So Samaria had a complex history with Israel going all the way back to then. It was at that time that Omri, the father of Ahab, <coughs> bought a hill in Samaria and built a city and began to rule over Israel. This is after the separation of Israel and Judah. So Judah has their king and Israel has Omri. Well, he ruled there for 12 years in Samaria from this city on a hill that he bought. And he was followed by Ahab along with Jezebel, ruling from that same place for another 22 years. So right there, Ahab and Jezebel, you know we got a problem, right? So it goes back to there. And then when you read 2 Kings chapter 17 and verses 24 and following, Israel has been exiled to Assyria. And the area of Samaria has been repopulated with foreign exiles from other countries. And they got a lot of problems going on. They're being attacked by wild animals and all sorts of things going on. So they call out to the Assyrian king. And he takes one Jewish priest, as it says in the Bible, that he had exiled to Samaria, I mean to Assyria. He takes that one Jewish priest and brings him back to Samaria to teach these foreign exiles about the Jewish God. So I believe that this is the source of Samaria's claim, the woman at the well, to Yahweh and the patriarchs, Abraham, and the Jewish refusal to accept them as equals. But here now, after this persecution, Philip, an apostle of Christ, has gone into this Samaritan town, and the people are rejoicing as it says in verse 8. So there was great joy in that city. So uh, I'm going to read Acts chapter 8 now, verses 9 through 25 from the NIV. Now for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, this man is the divine power known as the great power. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his magic. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized. 
both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. When the apostle, guys, I'm sorry, but I feel like I need a booster seat. I've got a kid at the adult table. <laughs> All right, picking up in verse 14. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. When they had testified and proclaimed the word of the Lord, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. So here we have the story of Simon the Magician. As it says there in verse 9, Simon is a boastful Samaritan magician or sorcerer, depending on your translation. Verse 10 it says he's known by the locals as the divine power known as the great power. Does anyone else have any other sort of title that's been put to him there? The divine power known as the great power. Now, when I looked at my sources, this was due to confusion on the Samaritan citizens and their ignorance because they were combining the Greek god Zeus with the Jewish Yahweh, considering them to be one and the same. So this great power, they felt like Simon did what he was doing, was coming from this pantheistic but monistic God. I, I don't quite know how they wrap their heads around that. But it does say in verses 12 and 13, but when they believed Philip, as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. So they believed, men and women, and Simon. That's the same Greek word that's used regarding all three subjects there. It's even the same Greek word that's used in Acts chapter 2, verse 44, on the day of Pentecost, when Peter is preaching to the believers. Uh, the great baptism that occurred then, and as it says in verses later, the fellowship of believers. The believers, again, comes from the same root word as these people believing here and Simon believing here. And then we know that Simon believed. Why? Because he saw the signs. He believed because he saw the signs and miracles that Philip was performing. And you're right, he was baptized, as were the people. And we're going to get into that also. But man, this is what I mean. The right thing for going on, but for the wrong reasons, you know. Uh, let's go to John chapter 14, verses 8 through 11. Would someone read that for me, please? John chapter 14, verses 8 through 11. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, 
And that will be enough for us. All right, stop right there. Who said that? <laughs> Philip, right? This is the same Philip that is in Samaria. Okay, please continue. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you since a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. <clears throat> Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Go ahead and read 11 for me, please. Okay. Uh, believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. The evidence of the miracles themselves. Mm -hmm. It's exactly <coughs> what Simon has now done with Philip. Mm -hmm. We had to go through that same process. Now, I don't know if that's irony or if that's full circle of the validity of the gospel as it's being spread. I just found it quite interesting that what is happening to Philip now, he himself had gone through. So we can go back to Acts now, chapter 8. Simon was believed on the miracles. Oops, I went to the wrong spot. He believed the miracles. And he, he was baptized, but it was not a belief preceded by repentance. It was a belief that was preceded by personal desire. He wanted what Philip had. It was not a belief followed by abiding faith, but a craving for personal gain. He wanted to be able to do what Philip and now John and Peter are doing. There's an interesting thought here. I, I studied with some folks that said that once you receive the Holy Spirit, you, you can no longer err. The Holy Spirit won't let you. Well, that, that's certainly not biblical. The Holy Spirit doesn't take away free will from the human being or their ability to remain ignorant of the Word of God. But you know, every believer, according to Acts 2, receives the Holy Spirit at the point of baptism, but not necessarily the power of the works of the Holy Spirit, which the apostles were imparting on people by the laying on of hands. I think there you're getting into verses 14 through 17 to a certain extent. Yeah. It's a very complex segment of this part of Acts I'm here. Dive into it. I just make it optional. Uh, well, and again, I will touch on it here in a minute. I, but you're right. I agree with you. Um, the Holy Spirit is present, but we have to be able to listen to it. You know, it's interesting. People have wondered why, why there was such a fertile field in that area. And it's highly likely that it was the testimony of the woman at the well. Because she goes back in town and she says, This man tells me everything about me. I often he wonder if it was the same town or just the region itself, if the word had spread that far between Jesus and Simon. Is, is, is I mean, he hated to be Philip. at least in her, her, her region. Where she was. But it's interesting because her testimony about his signs and wonders, mm -hmm. telling her about herself, is what got the town to come out and visit with him. And so this, this, this idea of Christianity to them is all tied up with signs and wonders. I agree mm -hmm. with signs and wonders. And Jesus said, you know, at least believe on account of that, you know. So it is a valid belief if taken in the right manner. <laughs> You know, Alan. Yes, ma'am. Um, speaking of doing things for the wrong motives, the same is applicable for those Pharisees and teachers of the law that wanted him to perform wonders and miracles only to please their desires, but it wasn't because they had faith in him. So it's, it's interesting how he didn't display his power to those people that he refused to fall into that trap. You're right about mm -hmm. that, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I do believe that they wanted to do it. So they could try to catch him with some technicality, some Jewish law technicality. <clears throat> so Simon's belief was not preceded by repentance, but personal desire. It was not a belief followed by abiding faith, but a craving for personal gain. In John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, 
to the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Now, right there, there's the true effect of belief. You must hold to the teachings of Christ. That means we have to live the way he tells us to live and do the things he tells us to do. Then, as Jesus says in John, you are really my disciples. Verse 32 says, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Set us free from what? The truth is setting us free from what? Sin. Why is it sin? And if Jesus is the truth, then it's setting us free from our sentence to eternal damnation. Eternal damnation? It's a not. life of sin resulting in eternal damnation. It's the idea of living under a system that you can't get redemption from by following a set of rules that you can't. A third good point. Relate. It's not the law that yeah. saves us, the Jewish law. Right. It is Jesus, sacrifice, right. death, resurrection, faith in him. So belief that's not freedom if you're always bound by certain laws. Like what did Paul say about that? He said sin or the law caused him to know that he had sinned yeah. and awoke the desire in him. In Hosea 4 6, he said, My people perish for lack of knowledge. When you come to know the truth, it sets you free from the ignorance, and ignorance is dead. <laughs> so back in verse 13, we had mentioned the baptism. Jack mentioned it a moment ago. Simon himself was baptized. Again, that's the same Greek word that is used for the baptism which occurred in Acts 2.38. Peter, Peter tells him, repent and be baptized, each one of you. But in Simon's part, it's still not a baptism of the heart, mind, and soul. It's only similar to the outward physical circumcision of the Jews that they had done them, you know, bound themselves to all along anyway. Paul writes in Romans 2, verses 28 and 29, a man is not a Jew if he is only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly. And circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit. That's the one Holy Spirit, not by the written code, the Jewish law. Such a man's praise is not from men, but from God. So that is what it, it would have occurred, even though the same word is used, would have occurred if Simon, we're in chapter 8, verses 9 through 25, by the way, speaking of Simon the sorcerer. That's what would have occurred if Simon had had that circumcision of the heart. Now, in verses 14 through 17, I'll read those again. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So Peter and John have come to town to support Philip and the New Samaritan converts to spread the gospel. And that's all I'm going to say about 14 through 17. <laughs> because that is a very intense. We have evidence of this here that occurs. We have evidence in another place where people have received the Holy Spirit and then been baptized. So there's a, an interesting point on that. The, the Holy Spirit can fall upon an unbeliever. It can fall upon it like it did. In, it happens in the Old Testament all the time. On the day of Pentecost. It's Saul it among the prophets. It, it fell upon every person so that they could hear in their own language. The power of the Holy Spirit fell upon them, but not a one of them had the indwelling until they were baptized. So there's the difference there in delineation, and that makes this fit. Well, there you go. Yep. In one easy lesson. <laughs> <laughs> Stolen from somebody else. Yeah. But uh at, oh go ahead. The Lord said that the word go forth from Judea to Samaria, but I want to talk to the word. 
That's the way it went. That's a great commission you're speaking of there, correct? That's yeah. the way it went in that order. Yeah. Yeah. To the Jews and then the Gentiles, which is what we're having. You know, man makes his plans, but God directs his steps. Oh, I agree. It's truly awesome. <laughs> so now here, and we see in these verses that Peter and John are sent. We have Philip, Peter, John, and the scam artist Simon. Because <clears throat> I don't know what he was doing. There, there could have been things going on there, but we know magicians these days, it's all about misdirection. But it's safe to say that Simon the Magician has not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When you look at verses 18 and 19, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Right here we have evidence of Simon's superficial belief, not a circumcision of the heart, but an outward circumcision. You think it was maybe just a, I'm just speculating, but because of his response, when, when he <coughs> talks to him, he's cut to the heart and says, pray for me. I wonder if he was just ignorant. Not, not well, I think he's ignorant from verses 18 and 19 here because it says to me, he's believing that the source of the Holy Spirit is coming from men. He thought he could buy it. When Philip has been teaching the whole time that it comes through repentance, confessing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the great commission that was spoken about, and being baptized. He just didn't know all that. He was ignorant of it. He just, so I he think to get baptized, I think. I think, again, he was still looking at the world of men. Why? Because he has this underlying desire for personal gain. I do, too. I just got to fight it every day. Yeah, I hear you, brother. But uh, he, I, I believe that he thought the source of the Holy Spirit came from men, not God, through repentance and confessing Jesus Christ as Lord. He didn't care where it comes from. He wanted back. Yeah. All right. Well, right there. That starts in verse 20, then. In verse 20, Peter answered, May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. Right here, Peter is actually pronouncing a curse on Simon. Both the NIV and the ESV have Peter say, May your money or your silver perish with you. My edition of the Greek English New Testament. Translates it, translates it like this. The silver of thee with thee, may it be into perdition. Not perish, but perdition. Let's go to John chapter 17, verse 12. And somebody read that one for me. Now, John chapter 17, one of the most beautiful prayers ever offered up because it's Jesus praying. First, he prays for himself. Then he prays for his disciples. And then he prays for all believers. Again, true believers. So John 17, verse 12, he's praying for his disciples. Can someone read that for us? While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept. And none of them is lost except the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. The son of perdition. Who's he speaking of this? Judas, right? We now have Simon the Magician and Judas both being condemned to perdition. Perdition. I know it's been co-opted by religion to mean certain things, but it comes from the Greek apoleia. A P O L E I A. <clears throat> Perdition is an everlasting state of torment and death. Everlasting state of torment and death. That's what Peter has just put on Simon the Magician. He understood it too. I wonder. He didn't want it. Oh, yeah, I know you know he didn't want it. 
go. In verse 21, here back in Acts chapter 8, verse 21, Peter tells Simon, you have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Simon's heart is not right. <clears throat> so Peter not only has brought upon the threat of perdition, he in effect banishes Simon from sharing or participating in the teaching of the gospel, the Great Commission, the Christian Commission. He doesn't want him to have any part of it. Excuse me a moment here. Some days go by and I don't speak much. It'll be basically go away dog or come here dog and that's about it for the day. <laughs> so yeah. Does he talk back? <laughs> yeah. <all over. laughs> yeah, who uh, who's the dog? <laughs> the Jetsons, wasn't it the Jetsons? Yeah. Yeah. All over. <laughs> so Peter's uh man is Simon from sharing and participating. But then we come to verse 22. Verse 22, repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. Peter still offered up hope of God's grace and mercy for Simon. In spite of Peter's condemnation of him. But how's that going to happen? How can that happen? He has to repent. Truly repent. And pray. Offer up in prayer his repentance. Then we continue on in verse 23. Peter tells him, I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. ESV and King James, the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity <laughs> are in the Greek unrighteousness. Want to be jealous. Sir? Want to be jealous. Simon? Yeah. He ain't done that crowd of people with him. Well, he lost a lot of yeah. followers, right? Yeah. I could well see that being yeah. part That's of the case. I want that. Yeah. You're taking my people. Put me back on top again. Yeah, I'm back on it. I'm in the poorhouse now. Yeah. <laughs> but Peter warns Simon that he's full of bitterness. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31. Let me confirm. Yep. Would someone read that one, please? Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. All forms of malice in the NIV. And what does that start with? Let all bitterness. Bitterness. The same thing that Peter has accused Simon of being full of. And in bondage. The bond of iniquity, captive to sin. Hebrews 12, 15 says, Looking diligently, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up and cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Said bitterness is a big thing to be on guard with. Right here, it's at the top of the list in Ephesians. Bitterness, rage, anger, <laughs> brawling, and slander along with every form of malice. It is a form of malice, and malice is ill intent, okay? You talked about, Kevin, about him possibly being jealous. This could be a form of malice. He would have ill intent upon Peter and John and Philip, you know? Well, he had money because he offered money. So he must have been making a good living. Oh, you know he had, man, because he was, he was charging for it. That's what they did. So this is not a singular transgression 
on Simon's part. It comes from a complete life choice. He is filled with bitterness. The gall of bitterness, the poison of bitterness. He is in the bond. Captive. The bond of iniquity, captive to sin. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 and 6, 4 through 6. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. This ver these verses here, when I picked up the Bible and started seriously reading at 96, I said, praise God, the humbling in my life. The scripture in Thessalonians about God giving them a spirit of delusion. And this right here scared the daylights out of me because I thought, man, am I going to get to this point where there is no hope? So go to Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 6, and somebody read that for me, please. It is impossible for those who have once sinned, have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, if they fall away to be brought back to repentance because of their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Now, I will not say that Simon, he had tasted the heavenly gift. He had heard the word. Philip preached the word. So he had tasted that gift. He had not shared in the Holy Spirit, most likely. But it says there in verse 6, it's impossible if they fall away to be brought back to repentance. Now it was in, before I actually found any comfort in this verse, it was in this very class on Wednesday night that this discussion came up and brought me great comfort and hope. Because the point that was made, it's impossible for this person to be brought back. There was nothing that Peter could do for him. There was nothing that Philip could do for him. There was nothing that John could do for him. But if, like Sandra said, he repented in prayer, he could bring himself back. I was reminded of David after his sin with Bathsheba. He fasted and wept because their baby was sick and dying. And then the baby died. He cleaned himself up, calmed down, and went about his business. And they asked him, what are you doing? He said, when the baby was alive, I prayed to God and hoped that he would change his mind. God can do anything. He is not limited. Now, there are things that we cannot do. You know, interesting thought. An unbeliever cannot fall away because he has nothing to fall away from. He's not... In, in Christ, he's not saved. In a so, sense, he's already in rock bottom. That's right. <laughs> so the implication would be that he was scripturally baptized. He was in Christ Jesus. He was praying that he didn't fall away and lose his salvation, which is contrary to a lot of modern teaching. But one can lose their salvation by spurning and turning away from God after they've received the gift and, and experienced it. Exactly what is well, talked about here in Hebrew, the Hebrew writer. Exactly. So. I think he did have the Holy Spirit dwelling in him. Yeah, I think he was a scripturally born again believer. Otherwise, it wouldn't have made sense to pray for him. He was already lost otherwise. He had to have been a saved person to pray for God not to hold it against him. Pray for God not to hold it against him. Because, to, you know, it's interesting, like Ananias and Sapphira, too. Only they could know, the apostles had the ability to know that those two people were lying. Nobody else could have known. Today, we can get away with it publicly because no one has the ability to see our heart and spirit. But at that time, it was to establish the church. Don't lie to the Holy Spirit of God. They both dropped dead as soon as they lied. Well, even Jesus would not commend himself to men when they were praising him because he knew what was in the hearts of men. 
Jesus and God know we don't, but they do. And in that very regard about there being no ability for Simon to receive help from godly people, God can accomplish it. And I thought about Romans chapter 4, verse 17. Can somebody find that and read it for us? As it is written, I've made you the father of many nations in the presence of him who is in the presence of him whom he believed, even God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. God can call things that do not exist as though they did. Calls into being things that are not as though they were. God can accomplish that. Something out of absolutely nothing. I mean, what is creation? Made out of things that do not appear. We can't see. We can't see. They do not exist until God calls them into being. I mean, it's it's not something that's out there that he takes and shakes up in the shaker and throws it out there. So what he did make, he had made the thing that he could not see and made it. God. That which is seen is made from that which is unseen. Right. So what we have here is though <coughs> Simon has no hope in salvation by the people around him. He could still at this point repent and confess and be saved. So we come to verse 24. Then Simon answered, pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. What do y'all think about that? I think we do that today. We pray for each other, right? Yeah. And we ask for him. And you know, why would he say that? Unless he's but what Peter just told him to do back in uh, verse 22. Peter told Simon, pray to the Lord. Well, Simon came to him and said, sell me this ability to put my hands on people and grant them the Holy Spirit, too. That's probably what we I think Simon still doesn't get it. I think instead of bowing before God in contrition and repentance, he wants Peter to do it for him. Well, I'd, like to like I'd like to have the ability to see what happens at the end of his life. The same thing with the rich young man. This is going to have to be on this point. I mean, maybe he didn't feel worthy after all that. Uh, well, that brings up a good a good Maybe perspective so because what what do we know about the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector the Pharisee in some translation says he prayed to himself or he prayed about himself the tax collector what did he do he said he wasn't worthy to be but who did he say it to he took it upon himself, even thinking that he, knowing that he was unworthy. He knew that he needed to pray to God. He didn't go up and ask that Pharisee, tap him on the shoulder and say, hey, say a prayer for me. Did he? I'm not mistaken. He said he couldn't even look up. He couldn't even look up. I've had friends of mine say, would you please pray for me? And one of the things I like to encourage my will, that the Lord would like to hear from you. I had a sister, family member who professes to be an atheist ask me to pray for her sister now there's something going on there you know yeah. why would she call me up and ask me to do that if it was not God trying to make something out of nothing but I also know that some people because I'm not going to use his name good friend of mine number 91 he said I know that the Lord would listen to you because you're a godly man well now again God listens to the heart of the bro of, of everyone who turns to him, right? With, with a broken spirit. So, yes, I will, but I encourage you. God wants to hear from you. I'm always willing to pray for the, and I do for this. She's not legally or technically a family member, but she's my family, okay? Mm -hmm. 
I pray to her every day, to God, for her and her sister that she asked me to pray for. But I also pray that God, whatever got started there, please let the bond grow stronger. You know, but right here, Simon, he doesn't do what the tax collector did. He doesn't do what you advise other people to do. You bow before God. He asked what? Peter, someone he thinks being more qualified. You are a godly man. So, hey, take care of this woman, would you? you know, get me right with God. Yes, ma'am. You know, Alan, it, it also makes me think about his level of ignorance. Because I'm thinking about the eunuch when he told Philip, unless somebody explained the scriptures to me, how can I understand? So Simon was, was still so... Obeyed in Christ. He, he was completely wrapped in, in ignorance, so he didn't even know where to start. At least yeah. the eunuch had read scripture and needed somebody to break them down for him. Now he had but been following Simon, Philip around. Philip had yes. been going through the town, you know, preaching. But it still shows his level of ignorance. He still doesn't down. get it. Why would he not get it? Maybe his greed was, was greater at the time. He's, he's full of bitterness. Money. He's full of captive descent. He's wrapped up in himself. Correct. He's wrapped up in himself. He only hear what he, hears what he wants to hear. And even that he takes and tries to twist it to his own personal game. game. I also think that he was pretty scared after what they told him, you know, that, <laughs> you know, he was, he was, man, he was scared. He didn't even want to pray. He probably should have been. I know yeah. that much. Folks, I only had 36 hours to get this together. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, kind of, Janice, what you were saying, I, I kind of look at that too. He was walking around and observing the miracles and the signs and wonders that they did. But he wasn't getting any doctrinal teaching. So he was still ignorant biblically or scripturally of the word of God. It's a superficial circumcision. It's not a circumcision of the heart. So he was I, going through the ritual. He was making a good public show. I, I may have had the same thing, man, because I was cut to the heart when I was baptized, but I sinned worse after baptism than I did before. Because if you don't put yourself on the altar every day, you can crawl off of it. That's an interesting point. Because it seems to me that now with my recommitment to God that came about in 96, I was baptized in the 60s or something, grew up in the church, walked away at 18, and then came back in my 40s. The question would be, did the first baptism take, or did you get baptized again? Yeah, I, well, you know, I've thought about it a few times, but I hadn't gone there yet. But the thing is, is once I got real serious about it, reading the Bible daily, Coming to classes, being with y'all in fellowship, trying to learn what I can learn, trying to put the teachings of Jesus into effect. That's when I became aware of how much I sin on a daily basis. Now, does that mean that I'm getting worse? Or does that mean that the Holy Spirit is growing into me and going, hey, look, you're working on that. What about this right here? It just happened while you weren't looking. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I, I choose to believe it's that. I give thanks to God. Every time I'm made aware on a daily basis, you just passed judgment. You just lost your temper. You just sat down and got lazy when you should have been up doing something for somebody. I give thanks to God because I consider that to be evidence of the Holy Spirit alive and at work in you. Well, we don't really, like you said, know the end of the story. Maybe that was at least a little bit of a start for him to where he doesn't he doesn't want anything like that. Maybe he'll maybe hopefully he did pursue it further and we don't know though, right? We can hope. We'll never know. Yeah. I think that's how we grow in wisdom every day. How do we grow in wisdom every day? By, by being Respecting him. Keeping our mind on him? Yes. Praying to him? Yes. Constantly asking for forgiveness. 
So I don't think Simon understood even at this point in verse 24. Because instead of bowing before God in contrition and repentance, he asked Peter to do for it. Do it for him. As if Peter is his advocate. Who's the only advocate that we have? Jesus. That anyone has. Jesus the Christ. All right, we're getting off early tonight. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Uh, if y'all would, I'd like to offer up a brief prayer. I thank you, Father, for this time together. And again, Lord, I thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit. It's my hope and desire that what I said made sense, that it was your truth, that it was received in the manner in which you would have it be received, Father, to benefit all those who heard our conversation tonight, Father, to bring us peace. Bring us endurance, to bring us devotion to you, Father God, that we can share it with others. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. Amen. Did anybody else have anything else they want to add? We've got a couple minutes. If there are any other observations, y'all would like to add. You did a good job, man. Oh, God did a good job. Come on, we've just been talking about it. I just want to, I don't think, I want to make sure we do still think that. Oh, I do. I pray for other people every day. Both both members of the body, my family, my church family, and people who profess not to believe in God. And I, well, we know, we have looked at other lessons where it says the prayers of a righteous man benefit. Uh, not that I'm saying I'm righteous, but I mean, but yes, we are told pray constantly and not just for ourselves. Now, come Sunday morning, if you want to join us over here, I'm talking about Psalms 3 and 4, two prayers of David. And I will actually touch on that. But at some point, he's praying. She can't do that. She needs another class. She'll move on. Well, it just at the end, it seemed like maybe it could be said that the I know I'm thinking specifically. I'm thinking specifically about Simon. Yeah. Uh, just making sure that everybody understood that. Yeah, he felt like there was somebody that could do it for him, and he didn't have to worry about it. Really? <laughs> No, we don't. We almost got there. Thank you, everybody.